Well, good morning to you. Good morning. Welcome to British Summertime. Hope you're well. It's uh, Sunday, March 25th, 2018. My name is Richie Allen. I'm looking out the window of the studio here and it is a absolutely glorious, glorious spring morning in South Manchester. It's gorgeous. Lovely to be with you. Missed you over the last few days. Genuinely have. Twitter is back. For me, it is anyway. I've been uh, logged out of it for quite a while, but I'm back into it now. So you can tweet me directly at any time during the course of the next hour. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. At Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Let me know what you're thinking. This is Sunday View. Of course, I'm going to look at the front pages of the national newspapers. Do that right away. Let's have a good show. Good to be back. Asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. Hadn't really gone anywhere anyway. Just a couple of days off. Wasn't feeling the May West, but back in good form now. Right then, I've given you the Twitter handle. It's at Richie Allen Show, live on Fab Radio 2, TriggerWarning.tv and RichieAllen.co.uk. It's the Richie Allen Show, broadcasting live on RichieAllen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Yeah, remember not to crash the jingles. Lesson number one when you're learning how to produce and present radio. Beautiful Sunday. It is absolutely beautiful. I hope you've had a good weekend wherever you're listening to the programme. We're going to jump straight in because there's a lot that I'd like to get through and I, I try to keep this to an hour because it suits the repeats, you know, when it goes on repeat is that people think they can get it at the top of the hour. So I'll try and keep it to an hour, I'm not sure. Clocks went forward, didn't they, overnight here? It happened two weeks ago in the US, so we're finally back in sync with our friends and colleagues in the US. So the clocks went forward. I hope you remembered. You must have remembered, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Right? <laughs> went to Formby yesterday. What a beautiful beach Formby is. Lovely to go back there again with uh, Caroline and the jazz. I'll briefly tell you what happened to me last week. The programme, as you know, I make five shows a week. It's nine hours of live radio. And because it's packed with content, with with audio, of course, and with guests that have to be researched. Basically, it's a one-man operation, but it's 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 like two, two and a half jobs. I'm not looking for any sympathy here, but it means that every now and then I just hit a brick wall and I can't talk, let alone move. And that's what happened. It's just a once in a, a blue moon thing. I could do, of course, operating at this level with a full-time producer and an editor, but that's never going to happen. That's just the way of it, and I'm not complaining about it at all. I love the job. It's a privilege to do it. But every now and then, the 16-hour days, and they are 16-hour days, and there are friends of ours, uh, Jean ann Crowley, whom I mention often, and others who will testify to that. It's a bit of a nightmare. It's a, it's a bit of a nightmare thing to take on. You do need to have more than one person running a live radio show. But look, it's never going to happen, so it's just always going to be me. I'll take better care of myself in the future. Uh, to be honest with you, it's my own fault because at weekends I should relax and I should take it easy and switch off and take my own advice, but I don't often do that. So then Monday, then you're back into it and you're knackered and you haven't rested. You know this, you probably understand it. I'm sure your own jobs are similar in terms of, um, you know, tiring you out and all of that. Anyway, let's have a look. It was lovely in Formby yesterday, beautiful. We were there just as high tide was approaching yesterday afternoon. It was great. Now, we're going to jump straight in. We'll start with the Sunday Observer and Carol Cadwallader's story. Now, Carol Cadwallader is the woman who broke the story on the Cambridge Analytica and Chris Wiley whistleblowing. She's all over this and she's all over a new story, which is kind of dot connecting the Cambridge Analytica Facebook story. There's a headline on the front page of the Sunday Observer. By the way, the the, the front pages are all on richieallen.co.uk if you want to see them. So the Observer headline is Brexit Insider claims vote leave team may have broken law. What's this all about? Well, a whistleblower who worked for the official vote leave team has broken cover to raise concerns that the masterminds behind the 2016 vote, including key figures now working for Theresa May in Downing Street, may have flouted referendum spending rules and then attempted 
to destroy evidence. Now, these are very serious claims indeed. These allegations from a former volunteer called Shamir Sani are detailed in an interview in The Observer and supported by a massive documents and files that he has passed to the Electoral Commission and to the police. Sani's central claim concerns a donation of £625,000 that Vote Leave ostensibly made to an independent referendum campaign organisation called Bet, excuse me, called Be Leave, B-E Leave. Now, he claims the money channelled to a digital services firm linked to the controversial Cambridge Analytica firm violated election rules because it wasn't a genuine donation. This money was registered by B-Leave with election authorities as a donation from Vote Leave to an independent youth operation. And the whistleblower, Sani, says B-Leave shared offices with uh, people like Boris Johnson and Michael Gove, which in practice offered advice and assistance to the group and helped them to decide where their cash would be spent. Law or electoral law in this country prohibits coordination between different campaign organisations. All of them must comply with spending limits. If they plan tactics or coordinate together, they must have a shared cap on spending. Now, Vote Leave strongly denies any such coordination. Sky News reporter Laura Bundock has been following this over the last 24 hours. Well, a whistleblower has come out saying he volunteered for the Vote Leave part of the referendum campaign, a man called Shabir Sani, and he is claiming that uh, Vote Leave broke the rules on spending because they exceeded the spending limits. How? Well, during the referendum campaign, uh, both of the big major campaign sides were allowed to spend up to £7 million. Smaller groups, of which there were many for both sides, could spend up to £700,000 providing that they were working independently so they weren't coordinating their efforts with one of the bigger campaigns. Now the whistleblower says this wasn't the case. He said he was drafted in to work for a group called Believe which was uh, looking at targeting the younger, the youth vote for Brexit and he said uh, Believe were working very closely and controlled by, he said, Vote Leave. He said this is a problem because Vote Leave gave them a donation of £625,000 and he says this shows clearly that they were overspending, that they were trying to use this smaller company uh, to siphon off some of their extra donations. All of these claims are strongly refuted by the Vote Leave campaign. He also claims, the whistleblower, that this money was then used to pay for services from a Canadian data company, um, a, a company that's got links to uh, the Cambridge, uh, the, the other company which has been in the news recently, uh, which has been harvesting the data of thousands of people. Uh, of, of people. Now, as we know, all these claims have been strongly denied. Boris Johnson, one, the Foreign Secretary, one of the leading voices in um, in, the, uh, in the Leave campaign, uh, tweeted this, saying that the story is utterly ludicrous. Vote Leave won fair and square and legally. He said, we are leaving the EU in a year and going global. Yeah, we're going global, said Johnson. So that's the gist of it there. They're trying to draw... They're trying to connect a few dots and it seems there we'll hear in a couple of minutes time how difficult it is for them to connect these dots that firms in Canada in Cambridge Analytica connected to this firm in Canada who was connected to this firm who donated this money it's all very vague and very gray and very misty but what they want to do is they want to create a narrative that shows that there was a lot of manipulation going on by those who wanted the UK to leave the European Union. And not only that, but people like you and people like me who did vote to leave, well, we were pretty stupid and our votes were swayed by this massive manipulation, right? Now, the Green Party's Caroline Lucas, very pro-Remain, of course, was quick to jump on this today. She says, something is rotten in the state of UK democracy and that these revelations show that there should be a national vote on the final deal. Caroline Lucas. Well, let me say first of all that I think that what these revelations demonstrate is that there is something rotten at the heart of our democracy and that we need to be overhauling our rules that govern elections, election funding. Is there really 
something rotten at the heart <clears> of our <throat> democracy because I still struggle to see. I mean, I can see that uh, data was harvested by, you know, from naive people who didn't understand what Facebook was doing, and some of it was used by a company claiming to be brilliant, mainly in America and not in here. I can't really see the absolutely clear connection with the Brexit campaign. There isn't, right? I'm, I'm just going to jump in there before Lucas answers. There isn't. I've gone over the Cadwallader articles and the claims made in them with a fine-tooth comb myself and I can't see any evidence that would make you go, right, OK, there's something there. This is Lucas's answer. Well, the links with Vote Leave, I think, are, are, are reasonably clear in terms of, of, of the allegations that have been made. And yes. Now, they're reasonably clear in terms of the allegations that have been made. That's a very interesting thing to say. They're reasonably clear in terms of the allegations that have been made. If they are reasonably clear, there would be evidence, not allegations. Allegations don't add up to evidence. I can make allegations about anybody or anything or any event. We can all make allegations, but without substantive substantive evidence, they're, they're only ever going to be allegations, right? Yes, for sure. We need to have more of an investigation, and that's what I'm calling for. What I, I want to see I is a real investigation into exactly who knew what. You know, the ministers associated so, with the Vote Leave campaign, what did they know about the money that was going to Believe? Um, what was the relationship between Vote Leave and Believe? And mm, then in terms, yes. what was the relationship between Believe and, of course, then Aggregate IQ based in Canada? Now, this is a, a really so, complex network, but it, big, big question need to be asked and it goes much wider than okay. just the referendum. What I am saying is that I think that well, it calls in, into question uh, the, 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 the legitimacy of the EU. I mean your own press release says this scandal calls into question the legitimacy of the EU referendum. I think, it, I think it adds further questions as to how that referendum was, was run. What I want to do is not rerun that referendum. What I want to do is to add weight to the argument that we should have a, a people's vote on the final deal. Yeah, I don't want to be calling for a second referendum, but I want a final vote on the deal. It's not an ass, it's a donkey, is effectively what Caroline Lucas is saying. Now, we're going to come back. This is really important stuff this morning. We're going to come back in a couple of minutes to the, to the evidence because the author of the, the journalist who broke the Cambridge Analytica story, the journalist who spent a year with Chris Wiley, this is a woman called Carol Cadwallader, and she's also written this story about the about the over you, you know about the, the the breach of electoral regulations by the vote leave parties. It's the same woman as Carol Cadwallader. We'll hear from her in a minute. Before that, though, the front page of the Mail on Sunday, its headline is about this story as well. The Mail on Sunday headline is a very long headline: PM's aid in toxic sex row over pro Brexit cash plot. Make it that what you will. This is the Mail on Sunday talking about these allegations made by this Vote Leave volunteer, Shamir Sani. But they're focusing on his claim that his ex-boyfriend, a man called Stephen Parkinson, who was a manager at Vote Leave, well, apparently Parkinson outed Sani as gay. Now, Parkinson is now working as an aide to uh, Theresa May, and he said, the reason I outed this guy as gay, was not for revenge, was not out of spite. I did it because I couldn't defend myself against other allegations without revealing my relationship with this guy, Shamir Sani. This has got all the elements of a soap opera, this story. It's so ludicrous, right? So that's the mail on Sunday anyway. For just joining the programme, Shamir Sani has been named as by the Sunday Observer and Carol Cadwallader as a whistleblower who has basically claimed that key figures who are now working for Theresa May in Downing Street, those were working on the Vote Leave campaign and this guy says he has evidence that shows they basically overspent, they broke referendum spending rules. Big scandal, right? Big scandal, right? Okay, we've had the mail on Sunday. So the Sunday Telegraph then the headline is, Facebook was warned of data risks seven years ago. I'll read you a little bit of this, not a lot of it. Facebook was warned that its users were at risk two years before the data of 50 million people was accessed by a controversial political firm, The Telegraph Can, 
disclose. In 2011, the social media joint the European regulator cautioned that it was failing to ensure the data was protected when passed to third-party software developers. Facebook responded with minor charges to the, changes even excuse me Facebook responded with minor changes to the way users were notified about how apps were gathering data but did not fully block the practice for another 4 years the discovery of the warning raises new questions about why Facebook did not act sooner to protect people's private information the story goes on to say, or the, the Telegraph goes on to say, in 2013, two years after the warning, Alexander Kogan, a Cambridge professor, used a personality quiz on Facebook to obtain data from 50 million users without their knowledge and then passed it on to Cambridge Analytica in violation of Facebook's rules, so on, so on, so on. Right? Right. It all ties in. Now, Carol, because they're using this you see, to, to try and prove two points. One, that the US election was swung towards Trump by the mining of data and by the targeting of people. But also, as we said a minute ago, that the referendum was swung in the way of those who wanted to leave again by these companies. Now, Carol Cadwallader, so she writes for The Guardian and The Observer. She broke the Chris Wiley story last week uh, you know, the whistleblower who has claimed that Cambridge Analytica took these profiles from Facebook and used them to influence people. It's her story, Carol Cadwallader. Now, she was on the Andrew Marr show today and she was sitting next to another journalist called Isabel Oakshot and they talked about Cadwallader's stories and the impact of them. And I want you to have a listen to this because it's very revealing and very interesting. Firstly, Andrew Marr says to Cadwallader, as you heard him say to Caroline Lucas, he said to Cadwallader that he's been following her stories with great interest, but he can't find any hard evidence in her writing of a link between Facebook and Cambridge Analytica on the one hand and the Brexit result on the other hand. So Mar says, I can't find any evidence. You'll hear Cadwallader respond and then Isabel Oakshot jumps right in. No, that's completely wrong, Andrew. You've got that very, very wrong. Where, where's the provable there, link? There, you've got, because Cambridge Analytica, which we've seen the fallout of that this week, we've seen what's happened to where's Facebook. Where's the provable link? The provable link is through to this firm in Canada. So we had a firm, we had a company. So, uh, the, the, the so main they, company, they say they're not linked with Cambridge Analytica, don't well, they? Well, uh, our guy... Uh, the, Christopher Wiley, who I've spent a year working with to come <clears> forward, can tell you absolutely categorically, he helped set up Cambridge Analytica, he helped set up aggregate... I so, Carol, Carol, I just think this is utterly baffling to most people. I know, I think you've done a fantastic job of investigative journalism here. You've been incredibly persistent, incredibly dogged, but at the end of it, all I think you've proved is that Cambridge Analytica is a pretty dodgy and bad company. I do not see an iota of That's, evidence, well, so one iota of evidence, that anything they may or may not have done had any impact whatsoever on the Brexit poll. Yeah, she didn't. Cadwallader also ignored the Andrew Marr question when he said the Canadian firm denies categorically having any links with Cambridge Analytica. Cadwallader says, oh, well, uh, Chris Wiley, uh, he knows all this, basically. Right, so it's all footsteps in the night and whispers in the wind, really. It's very good stuff, though, to be fair to Mar and also to be fair to Isabel Oakshot. Now, Oakshot doubles down on the point that there is no evidence and that basically Carol Cadwallader and The Guardian is effectively chasing unicorns. But there just that. isn't a conspiracy here. I mean, Carol, I just feel that you're kind of chasing unicorns. It's there not, is, a, it's there not is a conspiracy. No, there is no. It's big tech companies which are unaccountable and uncontrollable and we don't know what's going on. You know, so I'm this has all happened inside Facebook. I'm our really looking forward to uh, your next investigation. So, so you've, you've talked about Chris Wiley, which to people watching, he's the guy with the red hair. He's the, the pink, guy with the, pink, the, guy with the hair. pink hair. Did you know that he had pitched a vote leave? I'm um, using the same yes. kind of... You, yes, you knew of this. course I did. He's, he met with vote leave strategist in uh, the autumn before the referendum and he told Dominic Cummings, the strategist of vote leave, about Cambridge Analytica. And he Dominic Cummings said, I, I think technology. you're dodgy and had nothing to do with him, to be fair. No, yeah, precisely, as, as the same... Isn't that an incredible revelation there? This guy, Chris Wiley, who sold his soul to The Guardian and The Observer, claiming that there are links between companies in Canada 
and Cambridge Analytica trying to influence election results. This guy, uh, Wiley, went to Vote Leave and they thought, Vote Leave thought he was a bit dodgy, a bit dirty and said they didn't want to have anything to do with him. I wonder, has that played any part in Wiley's motivation to go public and to say that, oh, I'm going to blow the whistle, 50 million profiles were stolen by Cambridge Analytica and they were used to influence the US election and to influence the Brexit referendum. Come on. Come on. You know, you don't have to be Lieutenant Colombo, Jessica Fletcher, you know. As the same went for Leave.eu, who also ended up didn't, didn't using them at all. Leave. They did not EU, use them. who has proven we had somebody else come mm. forward on Friday and say categorically Cambridge Analytica worked for Leave.eu. They didn't now work they for Leave. That is just inaccurate. Okay. Carol, I was on the inside of the campaign. They did not. They did some work for UKIP. That is not the same thing. Listen, Carol, I have one question for you, and that is I think you've done a brilliant job. Are you going to apply this same forensic investigation to the Remain campaign? Are you? It, it, this isn't about remain so or leave. So it not. is not about well, remain or leave. So you're it not is going about to do an investigation into their spending. disrupting our democracy. It's such a, such a, such a serious So you're not issue. going to do an investigation into the remain to do campaign. With party politics. It but is it, not but it remain quite patently is. It Otherwise, is you would be doing remain. that investigation. Yeah, Andrew Marr jumps in then to stop the, the meow. The cat fight developing any further. But I'm being a bit unfair there because Isabel Oakshot did a brilliant job there. You know, Carol Cadwallader is an unashamed Remainer as a journalist. Now, I'm not criticising her for that because she puts her, you know, she pins her colours effect, you know, effectively to the to the mast of the Guardian. She says, yes, definitely, you know, leaving is a terrible idea. But of course, she's not going to apply the same forensic examination to the spending of the pro-EU Remain parties. Of course not. And of course it is political. It's all about chipping away at the referendum result of 2016 in a bid to reverse it effectively or keep the EU and the UK together via the back door, some sort of associate membership deal, a Brexit in name only, which David Davis and Theresa May have effectively agreed to anyway, as I talked about last week on last week's programmes, Monday and Tuesday. I wrote an article about this yesterday, data breaches on richieallen.co.uk. It was a bit of a tongue-in-cheek article, but the central points that I tried to make in it, I stand by them unreservedly. It is crazy for people to cry and to, and to whinge about their data being used by any third party in 2018. We've had the internet now for over 20 years, and people know that when they go online and they do anything, whether it's download a film, whether it's buying flowers, whether it's buying clothes, whether it's watching pornography, it's there. You leave a whopping great footprint there for everybody to see. You leave all clues, all manner of clues as to your identity, you know, the things you're into, the things you like, the things you don't like, your political thoughts, your aspirations. It's all there. And it's ridiculous for anybody to say that that information could be taken and could be used to influence people, right? It's an echo chamber Facebook. So even if these guys were targeting people, all they were doing was telling them what they wanted to hear anyway. Something I've gotten into in another article on the website this weekend about the Newsbud film on, 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 on activist journalism. People just want to hear what they want to hear. They want to hear what they want to hear. They don't want to hear anything that contradicts it. So... You know, <clears throat> there couldn't be any genuine evidence to show that people were manipulated into doing something they didn't want to do or they otherwise wouldn't have done. It's ridiculous. And stop crying about Facebook. You know, did you really believe Facebook when Facebook said, if you tick this box, only your friends will see your profiles? Now, I'm not saying that Facebook or the people who work with Facebook, I'm not saying that they were telling you a lie when they said only your friends or the people you authorise would be able to see your profile. I'm not saying they were telling you lies. What I'm saying is they didn't give a shite if third parties went looking for that stuff. And I said yesterday, a third division hacker, I've never hacked into anything in my life, 
But there are ways around if you want to find out something about somebody on Facebook and their profile is private or only for their friends. It's easy enough to find out what's on there. It's ridiculous this to be crying about it and demand an action. You know, I we know what Facebook is. We don't believe the official story of it. It was always there to... It, it was always designed or intended to be what it is now. This, the easiest, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. Open this thing up and people would actually come and give you every bit of information about themselves that they can think of. And you don't even have to put a gun to their head. That's been my opinion on, on this data breach nonsense anyway. It's exactly 25 minutes past 11 as I do this live Sunday morning, March 25th. This is Sunday View, back in exactly 90 seconds. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www. Markbayerski.com. It could just change your life forever. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. The Richie Allen Show relies on your support. Go to richieallen.co.uk and set up a monthly donation today. Welcome back to the programme. Dean Smith tweets, Richie, as a 43-year-old, hearing the propaganda from the government of the time from my dad, namely join the common market or lose your job, it was powerful stuff. After seeing that, it's definitely Facebook and the Russians who influenced my vote, says Dean. Uh, point well made. Uh, Dean. Hi to Martin. Hi to Base Ninja. Just look at how the EU leaders have rallied around me referencing the Russian attack. Well, that's a very good point as well. And that's what's happened here, you see. One of, one of the payoffs from blaming Russia without any evidence for the attack on Sergei Skripal and his daughter, Yulia, one of the payoffs is, is that their common ground can be found between the EU and the UK. But not only that, a point can be made and an idea can be put forward that the security of the continent depends on our joint cooperation. You really shouldn't leave the EU at a time when Russia is going back to the future and turning backwards and becoming this red threat, this red menace again that's hell-bent on world domination. And that's exactly how they're using that alleged poisoning. I say alleged because I haven't... Um, Apart from this morning, I didn't do much reading by way of news yesterday, but I understand there's, there have been no photographs of Skripal and his daughter, Yulia. And as the Russian ambassador to the UK pointed out a few days ago, nobody has been to see the Skripals to understand what their condition is. And I thought that the Russian ambassador was actually, was not too subtly suggesting that I'd have to see the Skripals in hospital before I'd believe they're in hospital. Right, but I don't know. Kim Erswell. Kim, good morning. Richie, I'm sorry, but I've become bored with the crap that Soy Boy Mar puts on the crappy BBC every Sunday. It's bullshit writ large. Well, that's why we challenge it. It's, it's why we challenge it. It's very important to challenge this stuff, I would say. Especially as 
you know, I'm not in the business of preaching to the converted, or at least I hope I'm not anyway, Kim. But I hear you. It is tedious stuff, there's no doubt about it. Mwinga, good morning uh, to you. Nice to hear from you too. These are the damned as well, to Martin in Spain, to Jean, who sent me a meme that alleges a connection between uh, various members of Parliament and George Soros. Thanks for that meme, Jean. Hi to Liz Froud, uh, that I mentioned Base Ninja, I did. Uh, and to John Larson, good morning, John. Thanks for the kind note and thanks for listening to Sunday View. Let's crack on. There's so much I want to speak about and time is against us. Now, we, we did the Telegraph just before the the break there. Also on the front page of the Telegraph is a story that says, well, the headline says, Russian TV stations show propaganda using UK bases. And the Telegraph says Russian-owned television stations are using Britain as a hub to broadcast Kremlin propaganda and conspiracy theories about the Salisbury attack across Europe, the Telegraph can disclose. Oh, the irony of that. Wow. We'll come back to it in a minute. The Telegraph writes, two stations identified by EU officials as spreading conspiracies about foreign politicians are transmitting programmes from Russia to former Soviet republics with licences provided by Ofcom. Those dirty bastard Russians! It's not bad enough, they're just poisoning people using chemical weapons and violating the sovereignty of the UK. They're now using the UK to make propaganda news reports to beam into former Soviet republics. What a shower of bastards the Russians are, eh? I think we should just stop all this fucking around and get all the nukes we have and bomb the fucking piss out of Russia tomorrow and to be done with it. Just just be done with it. Why carry on like this for the next few years? Let's just wipe Russia off the map. Why not? Madness this. Madness. The irony of it, of course, as well. Propaganda. And Ofcom should look at RT and propaganda being broadcast out of here. I mean, this is piss poor by the Telegraph. I'll tell you why. Because RT ran their own report yesterday about BBC bias against Jeremy Corbyn. And this is an unimpeachable report. It's an excellent little report. It's a wonderful, it's a marvellous little report. And it's unimpeachable. And it is embarrassing for the BBC. You want to talk about propaganda? Have a listen to this from RT. The BBC is under fire for its alleged bias against opposition leader Jeremy Corbyn. Viewers claim the channel is deliberately trying to portray the UK Labour Party head as too Russian. Picking up the story, Anastasia Cherkina. Take a look at this image that the BBC used in one of its flagship news programmes, causing quite a stir in the UK. Now, you can't see the image, but you can find it online. BBC has a programme called News Night. It runs every night at 10.30. It's a very big programme. It's one of the flagship shows. And they've got a massive video wall behind the presenter, who these days is mostly a guy called Evan Davis. And there were, there were, Davis was talking to people about Corbyn's response to the claims of poisoning, right? And on the screen, the massive screen behind him, was a picture of Corbyn, a silhouette of Corbyn in red, superimposed onto Red Square Moscow, and Corbyn had some sort of Russian type hat on him, right? It doesn't get any worse than that by an organisation like the BBC. So that's the image, you can see it online. Listen to the report. No, Jeremy's been on, Jeremy has been on the right side of history for the last 35 years. He's on the right side of history on Libya, on the right side of history on Afghanistan, on the right side of history in relation to Iraq. So which, which side of history is he on? The picture depicts opposition party leader Jeremy Corbyn on Red Square, wearing something that strongly resembles a Russian hat. And here is the original image. Suffice it to say, Twitter wasn't happy. Nice impartial backdrop there, BBC Newsnight. Perhaps could be split with a picture of PM clutching fistfuls of rubles and laughing. That backdrop is some absolutely shameful, shameful stuff. Asking for international cooperation and strong evidence before we ramp up war rhetoric is Russian collusion now, is it? Shameful. Columnist for The Guardian and Corbyn supporter Owen Jones pointed this out to the BBC on air. Yesterday, the background of your programme, you had Jeremy Corbyn dressed up 
against the Kremlin <laughs> skyline. It, no, 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 he's got to make this it was, point. It was, yeah, no, dressed, this up, point. dressed up as a Soviet student. It was, it was a real picture of no, Jeremy it Corbyn. Was, you even photoshopped his hat to look more Russian. This part of the debate was left out of the version posted online, something that also didn't go unnoticed. Yeah, we can't believe we're agreeing with Owen Jones, but Jones is right. They, soup, they, they actually photoshopped the hat to make it look more like one of those furry Russian hats. So the BBC is talking with two people about Corbyn's response to the poisoning and to programme the viewer into believing that Corbyn is some Russian sympathiser. Basically, he's a puppet of the Russian government. They put Corbyn's image across Red Square. They make his face red and they, 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 they use editing techniques to make his hat look Russian. You see, that's disgraceful. That's genuine propaganda. And when I grew, when, when I came up in presenting many years ago and producing, if I had been party to something like that, I'd have been fired for that. I'm not somebody who likes people to be fired from jobs. I like people to get a kick in the arse and a lollipop and told, listen, do it again and you're out the fucking door. That's what I prefer. Not to be firing people all the time. But whoever, this, it's obviously the VT editor. Or the producer of the program. In fact, it was the producer of Newsnight who decided, yeah, it's okay to have that image up there while we're talking about Corbyn to give the audience the impression that Corbyn is some sort of, you know, his loyalties are with Russia. Disgraceful stuff. And the Telegraph to be talking today about RT bias, you know. Need I remind you is that when you switch on the BBC, if the BBC is talking about the referendum, you are two and a half times more likely to see a Remainer guest than you are likely to see somebody who wanted the UK to leave. More on Corbyn in a minute. There's a very important story about anti-Semitism that I want to get into. 23 minutes to midday on this glorious Sunday, first day of British summertime. That's bullshit, by the way. It's, we've moved to British summertime, but we, we're, we've just entered spring, of course. The Sunday Express... The front page headline is called The Midwives. This is the story about the fact that there are not enough maternity staff or there isn't enough maternity staff in the UK. We need more than 3,000 extra midwives over the next few years. And there's also an interesting story in the Sunday Express today about discrimination against children with Down's syndrome. Apparently, children with Down's syndrome are not being put on transplant lists because it has been deemed that they may not live as long as other children. If that's the truth, it's fucking disgraceful. And I'm not trying to virtue signal here now at all. But if there is any truth in I didn't read the full story, that children with Downs are not getting a look in when it comes to transplants just because there's an idea they might not live as long, that's a terrible thing to do. It's dreadful. It really is. What sort of fucking mindset do you have to have? Anyway, I'm getting excited now. The Sunday Times, May orders four billion Brexit boost to save ailing NHS. May orders four billion pound Brexit boost to save the ailing NHS. Apparently she's going to overrule Philip Hammond and the Treasury by increasing funding to the NHS. This is according to the Sunday Times. The Prime Minister will announce an extra four billion every year for the next for the next ten years. That's a total of forty billion in ten years. The Times suggests the announcement stems from a growing realisation in the Cabinet that health has become the Tories' Achilles heel. The Sunday Times also leads on a story, which is interesting, that a fear of breaching paedophiles' rights is stopping the police from sharing information with social workers. I would argue that's not what the police are scared of. They're not really scared of breaching people's human rights and civil rights. We're supposed to believe that. And maybe in Rochdale, rather, maybe there were some of that. The reason they're not investigating people and why they're not sharing information is because when you start looking into organised paedophile gangs, you are only a hair's breadth away from somebody connected to the establishment in some way or another. It's as simple as that. And that's why they're not investigating um, paedophiles. That's why they're giving verbal warnings to people with child abuse images on their computer. This is why you have all this shit. Because they're protecting the child rapists and the Satanists at the very top of society, in my opinion. The Mail on Sunday, right? There's a story in the Mail on Sunday. This is a big story, I think. 
It's inside the Mail on Sunday. The headline is, You would never treat black people like this. Chuka Umuna slams Jeremy Corbyn over anti-Semitic mural row. Chuka Umuna, Labour MP. Now, Jeremy Corbyn was at the centre of another anti-Semitism row last night amid claims that Labour would never tolerate racism against black people in the same way. Branding Labour's response to anti-Jewish attacks as unacceptable, leading black Labour MP and virtue signaller extraordinaire Chuka Umuna, whose father was Nigerian, suggested that Labour would be far stricter with discriminations against black people. This row erupted as Corbyn struggled to contain Labour MP's anger over his decision to defend the artist responsible for an anti-Semitic mural. Have you seen this? If you haven't seen it, go online, well, if you have your laptop handy, or, or, your, or your phone or whatever, and put anti-Semitic mural into the search engine, and you'll get the image so you can see the mural. So Corbyn has been attacked because he defended the artist responsible for this mural, did he? What does the mural show? Well, it shows a group of hook-nosed men huddled around a Monopoly-style board. Corbyn has expressed severe regret for having questioned why the controversial picture on a wall in East London needed to be painted over. And he said he was opposed to the production of anti-Semitic material of any kind. But former Shadow Cabinet member Chuka Umuna contrasted Labour's shameful response to issues of anti-Semitism over the last two years saying if we were dealing with hatred and discrimination emanating in and around the Labour Party with regards to black people, I wouldn't stand for that kind of thing. And I'd be very surprised, actually, if the Labour Party dealt with that kind of incidence of racism in that way. Omuna said he wasn't having a go at the party leadership. And uh, he said that Labour has a real problem with anti-Semitism. We really must get our house in order, said Chuka Umuna, and also Gavin Shuker, another Labour MP, he's not too happy either. And he said, Jewish people are the only group that cannot define what constitutes racism against them. So what it was, was, what it was, was, back in 2012, Corbyn was on Facebook. He wasn't the leader of the Labour Party then. He was on Facebook. And he learned that the mural who which was painted by an artist called Caelan Ockerman, Corbyn learned that the mural was going to be painted over. Corbyn asked why. And he condemned the previous destruction of controversial political art at the time. So he said, why? Why, why are they taking it down? He was basically speaking for the rights of free speech. Why paint over it? That's what happened back then. But Corbyn has now flip-flopped and now he's apologised and he suggested that he didn't really look at it properly and he wholeheartedly supports the removal of the mural. Ackerman, the artist, has denied being anti-Semitic and has insisted his mural was about class and privilege. I don't know why they've jumped to the conclusion that these men are Jewish. There are no stars of David, no skull caps. Is there any resemblance to... One of the Rothschilds, it's been alleged that one of the men in the mural looks like one of the Rothschilds. Anyway, Deputy Labour leader Tom Watson, one of Corbyn's colleagues on the Labour shadow front bench, spoke with Andrew Marr today. Now, Andrew Marr showed him the mural, this horrible, vile, awful, hateful mural that had to be painted over. I'm laying it on thick here, but Andrew Marr laid it on thick. Marr showed him the mural and said, come on, Tom, what do you think of it? What did Tom think of the mural? My reaction is that is a horrible anti-Semitic oh, mural that was rightly taken down. And how long did it take you to glance at that, to, t to make that judgment? Well, look, you're showing it me on a 32-inch screen on national television, and I've seen it about 100 times on social media. Very different to seeing it on yes. uh, Facebook when you're in a, on the move. Because your leader um, apparently glanced at it, didn't look at it properly, and suggested to the guy who'd written it that it shouldn't be taken down. He said, uh, and I quote, Some of the older white Jewish folk in the local community had an issue with me portraying their beloved hashtag Rothschild or hashtag Warburg as the demons they are. 
and he said it was being whitewashed and taken down. And Jeremy Corbyn said, why? You're in good company. Rockefeller destroyed Diego Rivera's mural because it includes a picture of Lenin, which seems a remarkable thing to say. You only need to glance at that to see what it's about. It's, it's Third Reich propaganda anti-Semitism. Well, look, that is why Jeremy has expressed deep regret and apologised for that and has actually said that it's right that the mural was taken down. And yet, um, you know, it, it's taken years for some of your colleagues to get him to respond to this. Uh, Luciana Berger, who's a Jewish Labour MP, has been trying to get a response out of Jeremy Corbyn for a long, long time, and she's still very, very upset that he has not completely, fully apologised for this. Well, look, I'm very, very sorry that people feel hurt by this, uh, and that's why I think it's right that Jeremy has expressed regret for it. He said that uh, he didn't, uh, he didn't see the mural. He was talking about free expression, and I think, uh, you know, now that now that he has seen the mural, he's right to say that it was right not just to be removed, but for that he expresses deep regret for he, the he, offence caused by the mule. No, 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 no. Corbyn was right the first time when he said free expression, free thought, the mural should stay there. He was wrong to reverse himself. And by the way, Luciana Berger is a British woman, a British politician who identifies as Jewish. This is what they don't want you talking about. Not just Jews, by the way. Not just Jews, but other, you know, identity groups. They don't want you pointing out that, no, you're actually an Irishman or an English woman. You're not a Catholic. You're not a Muslim. You're a fucking Irishman. Right? You identify as a Jew. Jew is not an ethnicity. It's not a race. Your loyalties are to this country and to the people of your constituency, not to the Jews or to Israel or anywhere else. It's as simple as that. But you can't say that because it's anti-Semitic. And if Andrew Marr had a ball to his name, if he had a testicle in his underpants, he would say that when he interviews people like Luciana Berger. What are you, Luciana? I mean, you, you're not. You're an English woman who believes in the fucking fairy godfather in the sky. And because of your belief in that, you believe in your own supremacy. You believe that you and other Jews like you are supreme and are more important than every other person on planet Earth. You're a fucking nutcase. You're a human being. Number one. I'm a Jew. I'm a transgender. I'm a metrosexual. You're a fucking idiot is what you are. You're a person. Flesh and blood. Number one. That's what you are. This bollocks. Corbyn is an idiot to reverse himself. Have some courage, man. What, 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 what are you saying? I'd love to be Corbyn for five minutes. I'd love to jump into his body and do one of these interviews and nail Andrew Marr to the wall. And all the rest of them. What are you saying? Because I don't want the mural painted over? That I'm somehow anti-Semitic? Is that what you're saying, Andrew? Eh? Maybe I don't want the mural painted over because it looks lovely. Gorgeous colours there. Wonderful use of colours. It's real Proustian in, 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 in its existentialism. And all of that bollocks. I don't know what any of that means. And stick it to Mar. What about free speech? What about, what about getting rid of what aboutery? What about her? What about people who take offence to it? Well, fuck the people who take offence to it. I couldn't care less. It's a mural of a few guys playing Monopoly. <laughs> right? And anybody who read, uh, Ask those who read something to that. Why do they read something into it? Oh, I'm Jewish and it offends me. Why? Because it talks about Jewish power. Right? And? That's anti-Semitic. No, it's not. It's a fucking fact. It's a fact of life, love. Anyway, Tom Watson then talks about what Labour is doing to stamp out anti-Semitism. Apologies for the rant. We work with our affiliated organisation, the Jewish Labour Movement, to redefine anti-Semitism at our conference last year. I, I understand the concern do, out there. Do you there. agree with Chris Williamson that what's going on is the weaponising of anti-Semitism? No, no, I don't agree with that at all. But, but I, what I do think is we've got to work harder to stamp out anti-Semitism and that requires our own internal procedures to oh. be uh, faster in the way they okay. operate and, uh, and, and deeper. But all I can say the, is These allegations carry on. Every few weeks there's another anti-Semitic row involving the Labour Party. It seems to be something that you can't shrug off or slow off. Is this not the moment for you and for Jeremy Corbyn to go and meet the Chief Rabbi and talk it through and explain your position and start to try and get this behind you? Fuck the Chief Rabbi. What's that all about? This is lunacy dressed up as journalism. Shouldn't you now go to the Chief Rabbi of the UK, cap in hand, and, and explain to him that you're not really racist. No. 
Why should I? Who the fuck is the chief rabbi that I should be interested in him? God, I'd love to. I meant what I said. Just get me into, <laughs> give me some sort of witch doctory voodoo sort of ability that I can leap into these guys' bodies for five minutes and say, you know, you grow up, pal, you know. Why would I want to be running off to some rabbi? About what? Lunatics. Because if it goes on to the election, you're in dead trouble with Jewish voters. Well, well, oh, you're fucked if this carries on with Jewish voters. Listen, re-education for everybody. That's what they want. We used to say years ago, to see who's really ruling over you, you have to just look at who you can't criticise. It's gone beyond that. You can't talk about Jewish power. You can't talk about Zionism. You can't talk about the apartheid state of Israel, the slaughter, the humiliation, and the brutal um, treatment of Palestinians. Ahed Tamimi last week going to prison for eight months. You can't talk about that without being rounded on and accused of racism or anti-Semitism. Yeah... We're going to overrun, so I'm going to take a break. Um, I've got a few things I want to talk about. We're going to overrun. Um, quick break, back in a minute. We're going to talk about the Nazi salute and the pug, which I talked about very early last week, when I didn't know very much about the story, it has to be said. But it's very interesting what's going on there. And it's related, of course, to the Corbyn story. So we'll talk about that when we come back. This is Sunday View on March 25th, 2018. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www www.markbayerski.com It could just change your life forever. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. Asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on richieallen.co.uk. Fab Radio 2 in Manchester and TriggerWarning.tv The Richie Allen Show relies on your support. Go to richieallen.co.uk and set up a monthly donation today. Right, this from the Sunday Observer. Does making a film of a dog giving a Nazi salute constitute a hate crime? And should high street retailers stock racist and Nazi books? Two questions raised this week by a court case and a campaign, both of which expose the incoherence of much thinking about hate speech. In Airdrie Sheriff Court, Mark Meachin was found guilty of sending a message that is grossly offensive. He had trained a pug to raise its paw as if giving a Nazi salute when cued with phrases such as Sig Heil and Gas the Jews. And he uploaded the film to YouTube. At the start of the video, Meachin explains, My girlfriend is always ranting and raving about how cute and adorable the dog is, so I thought I would turn him into the least cute thing that I could think of, which is a Nazi. Now, this came up when I was speaking with Alison Shablo uh, early on the programme last week, and a story had just broken, so I hadn't seen the video. And I read the BBC headline, and it was obviously written in a way that um, would lead you to believe that the guy was some sort of anti-Jewish guy. And I said to Alison Shablo, well, of course he's entitled to do that. I wouldn't certainly, you know, put anybody in jail for doing that. But I think I might have said something like, you know, if I was if I was YouTube, I would ban him for a period of time. And if I was the court, 
I don't know, maybe I tell him to mind his behaviour and give him a small fine. But I didn't, I hadn't seen the video. And I had taken the breaking news, I know you're going to say the irony of it, but it, it just happened so quickly. I had taken the news story at face value, that he was some sort of Jew hater. I had no idea that he did it for a laugh. No, no, no idea at all. And of course I wasn't on air on Wednesday or Thursday. So of course, with context... I would say what the guy did was comedy, whether you find it funny or not, and he certainly should not have been convicted of hate crime. Let me make that absolutely clear. We were speaking about this kind of rhetorically with Alison Shablo. We were talking about satire and, you know, when, when when does satire and comedy, when does it stop becoming satire and comedy, and when does it become um, hateful? Or when does it become targeted? When you can say, look, it's targeted at people to humiliate people or to denigrate them. Now, I've seen the video and I don't know whether it's funny or not. I didn't, probably because I'd read so much about it, I didn't laugh when I saw it because I knew I knew what to expect. I believe Meachin. I don't believe there's anything hateful about it. He certainly, I don't believe he's certainly any hater of Jews. And it's madness to put him in um, a situation where he could end up in prison. It's ridiculous. People like David Bedil, uh, who, who who identifies as Jewish, who's a comedian, um, and he campaigns against anti-Semitism, he saw the joke and said it's a joke, it's comedy. Ricky Gervais, another very famous comedian, The Office and everything else, also said that this is comedy. Now, Andrew Doyle is a comedian, and he was on Sky News this morning reviewing the newspapers and reviewing this story. Andrew Doyle. Now, a lot of the debates that are going on about this are based around the idea of, well, is it funny, is it not funny, is it offensive, is it not offensive? Well, that depends very much who you talk to, because it's humour is so subjective. What is very clear, it, I think that misses the point, because actually the point is that the state has absolutely no business uh, locking civilians away for things they say or for things they think, and that really should be, and especially if it's something that you don't agree with or don't like, I think that's what we should be talking about. But, but the fact that it's published, then that takes it into a different realm, doesn't it? Because it's no longer a, a personal view when you shared it, as he has done, because he's a YouTube comedian. Yes. That takes it into another realm. Yes, but the, 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 the criteria seems to be that if it causes offence, then he should be criminalised, that offence is the priority. Now, that's a problem, because the court actually ruled, and they said, that context is irrelevant and intention is irrelevant. Now, if you watch the video, it's absolutely 100% clear, whether you find it funny or not, the intention was to be funny. If you take context and intent, uh, away from this, then comedians aren't safe to make jokes. That's a very good point. Comedians won't be safe to make jokes. Criminalizing, criminalizing thought is where this ends up, and he makes that point very well here. Reminder: You're listening to the comedian Andrew Doyle. We're going to end up criminalizing thought and criminalizing humor. Freedom of speech is something that is essential to any democratic society, and we need to protect it, even for people who say things that upset us. Well, it's, except, of course, I mean there are there are rules and regulations again against hate speech, which mm. uh, presumably this is this is falling under. Uh, this falls under the, the classification of hate speech. I have great reservations about hate speech anyways as a concept because for me, I like the idea that racists and bigots are able to out themselves. I like to know who those people are. Mm. I want to know where they are. I want to be able to argue against them and show them why they're wrong. But, but training a dog to respond to the command, gas the Jews. Yeah. Yeah, that, of course. That's not funny. <coughs> and that does cross that You say it's not funny. I, I, don't, doesn't it? I don't find it funny. Um, it was shared three million times on YouTube and lots of people in the comments clearly did find it funny. So um, the, the argument that's not funny isn't a, a suitable argument when it comes to a joke because it is far too subjective. Who gets yeah, but isn't decide? that bordering on, on racism though? Um, it, it, well, the point is that the, the video is not actually anti-Semitic. Okay, let me explain. He made the, he, the point is that a pug is a very, very cute, sweet animal and in yeah. order to I mean, I know what his, he was yeah, trying to do. He's trying to, he's, he's trying to turn it and he says explicitly in the video, I'm trying to make it in the most evil thing I can imagine. Mm. So the fact that the phrase is the worst thing you can imagine is the joke. That's the point. Now, whether or not that's funny, whether or not it's offensive, that's besides the point. The intention is clearly to, to make people laugh. Mm. That's the point. Now, if you criminalise that, it is a very dangerous precedent. It is. It's a very dangerous thing to allow a judge say that context isn't relevant. Of course context is relevant. When I made a comment on this last Tuesday, I hadn't seen the video and I took it for granted that this man whom I'd never heard of, by the way, I took it for granted without seeing the video that the guy was doing it to wind up Jews. Which, if that was the case, would be a stupid thing to do. But even then, I would say, you know, you don't jail anybody like that. Just give him a 
you know, a friendly warning. Don't be winding up people in that way, maybe. Maybe, or maybe not even, right? But I haven't seen the video, so context is totally important and totally relevant. When you see the video, you can see that the guy is doing it for shits and giggles. Not to um, put the wind up Jews or to offend people whose parents might have died in Nazi Germany or grandparents or whatever. So context is very important. Very interesting story that and where that might lead, of course. Now, finally for today, we have gone over the time drat. I like to keep this within the air. I told you why earlier on, but anyway, this this is important as well. I wrote about this on the website. John Bolton, the maniacal, psychotic, lunatic. Let's find more adjectives to describe him. Bolton, the man who was the director of the project for a new American century. Bolton, who never saw a foreign country that he didn't want to ev- to invade and raise to the fucking ground. John Bolton has been appointed as national security advisor to Donald Trump by the hairpiece himself. What are Trump supporters doing now? And God love them. I'm not picking on them because I said the same to Hillary supporters, Corbyn supporters, Sanders supporters. You know, when are they going to realise they've been duped by this crazy bastard, Trump? When are they going to realise that Trump is an arch-Zionist puppet? Getting this nutcase Bolton to be your national security advisor. You know, the guy who was, 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 was obviously very significant, another disciple of Leo Strauss. If you don't know who Leo Strauss is, find out. Zionist, Jewish-American Strauss who eventually gave birth to neoconservatism. Look up Wolfowitz, William Kristall and all his disciples. Lunatics. Because, of course, neoconservatism is Zionism dressed up. It's, it's, a, it's a, a disguise for Zionism. When these guys wrote the, the Rebuilding America's Defences document back in 2000, and they were talking about America fighting multiple theatre wars to assert its hegemony in the world. They were really talking about Israel. It was all bullshit, right? Bolton is a crazy warmonger, and he's been appointed as Donald Trump's national security advisor. Have a listen to Bolton speaking a few weeks ago with the Fox News presenter, Tucker Carlson. This is an interesting exchange. So it feels like... We're moving kind of in slow motion toward a conflict with Iran and Russia in Syria. Do you think we are? Well, I think that's one possibility. I think the uh, Iranians have clearly gamed what they plan to do after the defeat of the ISIS territorial caliphate. Yes. I think they were thinking of it when our strategists were not thinking of it, and we, we, we're now suffering the consequences with Iran literally on Israel's border, flying drones into Israeli airspace. Uh, I don't think that's the really most dangerous aspect of the Middle East, though. I still think it's uh, Iran's support for terrorism and, and its continued effort to get deliverable nuclear weapons. Right. So obviously Iran was greatly uh, empowered by the fall of Saddam. I think we, in retrospect we can concede that. There haven't been any Iran-sponsored terror attacks in this country that I'm aware of in the last 25 years. There have, of course, been many, many, many sponsored by uh, Saudi Arabians of the Gulf states and the, the Sunni uh, Arab world. So why should we see Iran as our primary threat? Because Iran, for many decades, has been the world's central banker of international terrorism, funding Shia, Sunni terrorists on an equal opportunity basis, uh, providing arms to them as they do to Hamas and the Gaza Strip. So it's their support for terrorism generally that, uh, that should concern us, not necessarily specific attacks in the United States. But, I mean, wouldn't, I mean, in order to, you know, commit American troops and the billions it takes to prosecute any kind of conflict, would wouldn't you want to go after the people who are attacking us here first? Yeah. Well, nobody's talking about committing massive amounts of troops. What we have to worry about, I think, uh, most uh, importantly, uh, is the threat of North Korea's nuclear weapons program, oh. which is more advanced than Iran's. But it all ties together in the Middle East. Uh, you may have seen reports recently of a UN uh, inspector's uh, uh, study of North Korea selling chemical weapons, precursor chemicals and equipment to manufacture chemical weapons to Syria. Right. Likely the greatest by load Iran. of bollocks of all time. And until that point, Tucker Carlson had been doing okay. He had challenged Bolton and said, well, our friends, the Saudis and others, they've had 
um, terrorists come out of those places and attack us. The Iranians have never done anything to us. Good stuff by Carlson. But when Bolton invents the wild on-the-fly fiction that the North Koreans were selling the compounds to make chemical weapons to Syria, Tucker Carlson should first of all fall off his chair on live telly, rolled around the ground laughing and kicking his legs in the air and then got back up and said to Bolton, that's fucking genius, that. That's the best stand-up comedy I've ever heard in me life. He should have ridiculed the bastard, but he didn't. Here's a bit more of Bolton and Tucker Carlson. So you've, you've called for regime change in Iraq, Libya, Iran, and Syria. In the first two countries, we've had regime change, and obviously it's been... I'd say a disaster. I think we no, agree. No, okay. I, I don't agree with that. And, and let me let me. You don't think it's been a disaster? No, because to argue that you have to argue. Let's just take Iraq. Do you know why he doesn't think it's been a disaster, John Bolton? I'll tell you why. Because it, because the result was exactly what was intended: chaos, death, destruction, people driven from their homes and villages and driven into Europe. That was the plan. So Bolton is like, no, it's not been a, a disaster at all. But of course, he can't say why it hasn't been a disaster. He has to say, well, we got rid of a brutal dictator and we did all of that. But really, chaos, migration and lunatic head chopping jihadists running around having the time of their fucking lives. Well, that was actually the plan there, Tucker. So it wasn't a disaster at all. It was wonderful. Listen to a little montage of John Bolton over the years. And then tell me you're a Trump supporter. And then tell me that Trump is draining the swamp and that Trump is going to change things as we know them. This is John Bolton. The way you eliminate the North Korean nuclear program is to eliminate North Korea. I'm worried not just about North Korea, I'm worried about Iran too. Russia, China, Syria, Iran, North Korea. These are regimes that make agreements and lie about them. My view is that Snowden committed treason. He ought to be convicted of that, and then he ought to swing from a tall oak tree. Uh, I thought he should have been prosecuted uh, with the death penalty in mind. I do think he committed treason against the United States. Do you think that President Obama will tell the American people honestly what happened at Benghazi? Well, you know, we couldn't care less about North Korea, frankly, if instructive, productive dialogue. That's not going to do any good. But is the loss of one American city, pick one at random, Chicago, is that a tiny threat? I think the retaliation should not be proportionate. I think it should be decidedly disproportionate. I continue to favor any steps that lead to the overthrow of the regime, and I think that should be official American power. Marvellous. That was John Bolton, and that was Sunday View. Thanks for listening to it. I've been Richie Allen. Look after yourselves and one another. Have a brilliant Sunday. That was Sunday View. Great to be back with you. Speak to you tomorrow at 7 on Monday's Richie Allen Show. Until then, it's bye for me. Bye now.